hello, boys and girls. This is uh, Philip Martin. This is uh, on film, on video, and we are snowed in. It is cold here in Arkansas, and um, we have not had many difficulties, really, to be honest. Uh, we're pretty self-sufficient, just like Arkansas itself. You could build a wall around us, and, you know, we can live. We can thrive, just like Israel. Um, but um, we have a, a problem with the um, hot water heater, so I have not taken a shower this morning. And therefore, I'm wearing my Mike Nesmith wool cap, and uh, <laughs> we are um, doing this in the in a kind of a cold because we've done it our we've doing it, we're doing our part. We've turned the thermostat down to 58 up here upstairs in the um, studio here. So you know, don't say we're wasting energy or anything because we're doing our part. We're doing our best. This is a second. <laughs> It's a shame that there's uh, snow on the ground and people aren't going to be able to move about like they want because this is the second week in a row that we've got a really good film opening. And I want to talk about Judas and the Black Messiah too because that was a good film that I hadn't seen last week when I did this little little, um, little video. So, And that may actually crack my end of the year top ten, which is the uh, what I'm going to be working on as soon as I finish this. I mean, I'm, I need to sit down and actually do my ballot for the Southeastern Film Critics Association um, organization I vote in. I've voted in for 20 years, and, you know, and uh, we're going to do our uh, voting and have it tabulated this weekend. Fine. Um, you, as you know, I don't really care much about those sort of year-end kind of things because... They just don't make a whole, they don't stick in my mind. I don't really think in terms of, well, this movie's better than that movie, which is better than that movie, which is, you know, in the top 5% or, or whatever. It's just every movie's an experience, and you experience it as you experience it, and it's never the same as you experience it again. Okay. <laughs> so these things don't mean as much to me, and I don't know. You know, the cinematography in Nomadland, which opens on Friday, and it's, it's just beautiful. I mean, it's just you know, all this magic hour desert uh, skies, peach, pale peach, and these campfires. And, you know, it's just beautifully imagined. And it looks like the real world. It's not like we were watching the other day, or Ruby in Paradise, which is coming out again somehow. We're, we're going to do it. We'll find out all about that in a week or so because we're going to do an interview with uh, Victor Nunez, the uh, director of Ruby in Paradise. And we'll let him, you know, kind of um, tell us. About, we'll, we'll, we'll revisit it then. But anyway, I remember Ruby in Paradise, which I only watched maybe the first hour of again, uh, as this really beautiful kind of pastel streak film set in Panama City Beach, Florida, which is an ugly little town going by Ruby in Paradise, at least, and going by my experiences on the Florida-Bama border. It's also an ugly little town. No offense, David Basil. Um, but it's made beautiful by the eye of the person who is perceiving it through the lens of the camera. And I don't know who that was in Ruby in Paradise. I do think I should have probably written the name now before I came up here. Uh, I should have looked it up, but I do remember being struck by how beautiful that film was. And you think about that film, and it's been 28 years, 20, yeah, this is the 28th years that it's been out. It's one of the first films that uh, Karen and I, and my wife, actually saw together um, after I came back. Well, at first, we ever saw, when we were going out and stuff, uh, it was one of the first films we went to see. Um, we got married in 93. And uh, it may have come out that summer or something, but I do remember. She has no memory of it at all. Doesn't remember it at all. I remember going to the movies with her, and I remember seeing this, and I remember the cinematography. And the interesting thing is Todd Field, who plays the good guy, the morose good guy in that movie, as opposed to Bentley uh, Mitchum, who is Robert Mitchum's grandson, who is the kind of uh, poser slash sleazy guy in that movie. Uh, no, he directed In the Bedroom, and he directed, oh, God, some other film that was really good. And he hasn't really been heard from since, and I wonder what happened to Todd Field, you know? Uh, 
And it strikes me about, you know, you look at a movie and you watch the credits and you see all these names in the credits and you see these people who, who wrote it, who sent it, who shot it, who directed it and all that. And, uh, you know, I wonder where they all went because some of them do have careers and they, they build on it and some of them are working behind the scenes and you never really hear them again. I have friends who work in Hollywood and I have no idea how they make a living because their name shows up on a movie every 10 years but yet they're still able to do it. So I don't understand the business. I don't pretend to understand the business. But it's just remarkable to think that, uh, you know, something like Ruby and Paradise came out 28 years ago, the first movie for Ashley Judd, and she does look very young in it. And um, I, I, I remember it. I mean, I don't remember, like, the plot, and I don't remember exactly how it resolves. But I do remember like the opening scenes and I remember some of the shots on the beach and some of the shots on the pier. And I, that cinema, it's, it's a visual memory. It's not something like I recall from um, reading in a book or something like that. It's not like I recall the story. I just recall these, these different images. And it's, a, it's an interesting medium. I suspect Nomadland's going to be like that for me, too. I suspect, one of the reasons is because, like Ruby in Paradise, it's a story of, it's an ordinary story. It's a story about an ordinary woman who's in not all that extraordinary circumstances. I mean, Frances McDormand uh, basically is forced for economic necessity to go live in her van and travel around the country and take odd jobs in different places. That is not the stuff of high drama. That is not a heightened uh, conflict in the world. My, my dogs are barking now. I can't stop this, but this is one of the problems with using this particular program because I not pause it and come back and pick up where I left off. So I, I, I've got to kind of work through it. So. <laughs> But anyway, maybe this will be short. But I mean, anyway, the, the, the parallels between Ruby and Paradise and... and, and uh, Nomadland are, are pretty interesting to me because it's both about a woman uh, uh, Frances McDormand is Fern who's 60 in her film and uh, Ashley Judd has got what 20? A third of her age and she's running off from a bad relationship in Tennessee uh, her mother has died Frances McDormand's husband has died and her town has closed down because of the gypsum mine. And they're both kind of economically, you know, they're, they're, they're poor people. And you don't see poor people portrayed on screen the way that both of these people are portrayed. Because they're just sort of ordinary people who are just doing sort of ordinary things. But they're both smart and they're both complex and it's enough. The director, writer, director believes it's enough to engage you. He, she is giving you credit for being alive and being smart and being able to figure this stuff out for yourself and being able to discern those qualities in this character uh, on your own. So, you know, I mean, so maybe, you know, I was thinking about, I mean, we're going to have, I mean, Dan uh, Leibarger, who watches these things, hi Dan, uh, is going to try to interview Victor Nunes. And I think that's a really kind of a interesting thing to, to bring up because Nomadland is sort of Ruby in Paradise. A lot of parallels to it. Okay? I don't know. I mean, anyway. And we're going to think, oh God, am I talking out of school? I'm, I think we're going to do this uh, series in May for the Arkansas um, Museum of Fine Arts, formerly the Arkansas Arts Center, but the Arkansas Museum of Fine Arts and the Arkansas Cinema Society. I think we're going to do this thing in May where I'm going to do a number of films. It's going to be called Introduction Film or something. And I'm going to talk about, you know, just how films are put together and how they're made. And it's going to be much less... And I hope more, much more than like a film school sort of thing, you know, in a survey of, of film. It's not going to be, you know, it's going to be films I really like. I mean, I th and I think one of, one of the ones we're going to do is the Zoe, uh, Zoe uh, Chloe Zhao's uh, first movie uh, before No Man Land and before The Writer, Songs My Brother Taught Me. 
I think we're going to do that, and we're going to do Killer Sheep, I think, and I think we're going to do Shotgun Stories, and we'll probably do one other. Uh, Ruby in Paradise would not be a bad one to do, and I'm sort of thinking about that because it was Victor Nunez's first film, and his uh, uh, and he wrote it, and maybe it's worth um, looking at. I mean, I think I can get the rights to it. I'm thinking out loud, and I've got to put all this in a memo and send it to the, the people who are actually going to take care of all this stuff. Uh, so there. Uh, but Movie in Paradise might be one that we do too. I mean, it would be an interesting thing to talk about that. We were trying to get more, uh, but we do have, uh, we're trying to do, you know, black creators, women creators, and stuff like this. But Victor Nunez, you know, it's only four four movies, so maybe he'll, he'll work in there. I'm, I, I really don't know, and I probably shouldn't be talking about it, but it's just us, just us film people. So, you know, maybe we, maybe we can work something out. Anyway, I want to talk a little bit about Judas and the Black Messiah because I hadn't seen it last week and I didn't really know what to make of it. I really didn't know. Uh, you know, I'd read some things and I'd read the review. Uh, maybe at this point when I was doing the video last week, I hadn't read the review. But I, you know, I knew I knew it was going to be good or going to supposed to be good. You know, uh, I have a little bit of a when I was a working with Spectrum, uh, Spectrum Weekly here in Little Rock. Um, we were part of the Alternative Newspaper Association. I can't remember what it was called. AESFE or something like that. Um, which might be the wrong acronym. But anyway, it was a, it was a, it was like, a, you know, the association for alternative newspapers and free and alternative newspapers or something like that. And uh, we, you know, knew people in other places and I knew the Chicago reader people and one of the reasons was because I was sort of living part-time in Chicago at the time I had an apartment in Chicago and we won't go into all that but I was going up there most weekends and staying in Chicago and one of my friends who was working for the Chicago reader did this story on Bill O'Neill actually he had I think that the, the and this is 30 years ago this 1990s so don't hold me to this but I think what had happened was he was trying to interview Bill O'Neill and I was really interested in that and Bill O'Neill is played by Lakeith Stansfield in the movie Judas and the Black Messiah okay he was the FBI informant he was recruited when he was like 17 or 18 uh, after done some stupid joyriding thing the FBI came to him and said you're going to prison for five, six years, or you can do this. You can join the Black Panthers and tell us what's going on with them, basically. So Bill O'Neill became this informant for the FBI, spying on Fred Hampton, who was the young, and I mean very young, I mean he was 21 years old when he died, uh, leader of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panthers in Chicago. And Bill O'Neill got to be fairly close to him, got to be really close to him, got to be the uh, it got high up in the in the Panther organization, and all the time was reporting to the FBI about this. And even there's a lot of there's a lot of controversy, and 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 people deny this. But anyway, some ways, you know, the movie sort of alleges that he drugged Hampton before um, Hampton was before the raid that killed Hampton. Uh, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's even alleged by anybody. I know it's been alleged, but I don't know if there's any reason to to take that as anything more than a fictionalization I don't know uh, there is more evidence that he may have out drawn a, a diagram of Hampton's apartment on Monroe Street in Chicago um, to help the agents figure out how they were going to go in anyway anyway Bill O'Neill was a rat but he was a rat uh, who was recruited by the FBI who was told that um, you know he needed to do uh, this for his country and this was going to you know save lives basically it was the the, the Panthers were violent and all this and it's just not true but anyway this is what Bill O'Neill 17 year old kid 18 year old kid was told so he goes in there and he infiltrates the Panthers the feds come and kill Fred Hampton and the movie is a really empathetic to Bill O'Neill. I mean, it's, re it's, it's really mostly from his 
point of view. Lakeith Stanfield is probably has more screen time than um, than Fred Hampton in this movie. And and anyway, I know about Bill O'Neill because, like I said, back in 1990, uh, my um, friend at the Reader was either trying to. I, I, I think he was trying to interview him, and I, I wanted to interview him too because I was I've always had a real interest in that sort of era because I grew up in I I, I lived through it I was uh, in uh, Haight Ashbury in sixty six sixty seven sixty eight uh, I knew about hippies I knew about Chicago nineteen sixty eight as as I wrote about when I wrote about the uh, trial of Chicago seven last year you know I was actually a kid who carried around. Tales of Hoffman, the, the trial of Chicago 8 slash 7, you know, I carried that around with me um, for a while, and I, you know, I remember reading that book, and I had it for years, and I knew all about uh, Dave Dellinger, who I wrote about, and, and the other, you know, radical leaders and stuff like that, so, you know, I've got an interest in this, and I mean, so I wanted to interview Fred Hampton, uh, Fred Hampton. I wanted to interview Bill O'Neill because he had come back to Chicago. The word was he had come back to Chicago after being in the witness relocation program for some years. And in 1990, or in 1989, actually, he was back in Chicago. Okay. January, January 15th, 1990, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. There is a show that airs on... PBS, uh, Eyes on the Prize 2, the second documentary that the uh, Eyes on the Prize documentary about the uh, civil rights era. Bill O'Neill is interviewed in this segment, and if you go, you can find the long transcript. It was really interviewed for quite a while, and it's really if you read the transcript, you will see where they got a lot of the ideas, or maybe where they got a lot of the ideas. You know, for, for Judas and the Black Messiah. It's almost like you can reverse engineer the movie by looking at the source material that was available to them. It's got to be one of the sources that they looked at. All right. Um, and it's a very short interview, and it's it, and in it basically Bill O'Neill says, look, I was a kid, I was young, and I think I did the right thing. I really am, you know, I'm not proud, but I'm not ashamed either. I think I did my duty you know, spying on the Black Panthers. And at least I got off the fence and I did my part and I said what I said. Anyway, that interview is running that night and Bill O'Neill is in the apartment of a friend of his and they're drinking beer and they're sitting around. Suddenly Bill O'Neill gets up and tries to jump out the window. It's only a second story window, but it would still hurt. You know, he's, his friend dissuades him from doing that, grabs him, Bill O'Neill runs out, goes out the back of the building, runs onto the Eisenhower Expressway, hit by a car, killed. Suicide. Second time he had run out on the Eisenhower Expressway that he had, uh, you know, tried to commit a suicide, I guess, uh, or at least acted very recklessly with his own life. So, you know what ends up, and and I think there's a there's a piece that was written uh, called the uh, last night of William O'Neill or the final hours of William O'Neill or something in the Chicago Reader. I vaguely you know kind of remember it. Uh, I had, I don't think you can see it because I think it's I think it's paywalled. I'm not sure, but anyway. Um, anyway, so um, I didn't ever interview William O'Neill, but I. You know, he's one of those people that I was aware of. So when they said this movie was coming out, I wanted to see it. It also had some pre... Uh, I had some prejudice about it because I figured that they were going to make Bill O'Neill the villain, which probably, arguably he deserved. I mean, I didn't really see a way to make the movie that you didn't make William O'Neill, the villain, because Fred Hampton is obviously the guy who's executed, and I think just about everybody kind of agrees he didn't have it coming, guys. You know, um, I, I really think that we we can get past that 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 he got what he deserved, or he was a communist who was trying. I don't know. Again, so what? You know, he was murdered by federal agents. Okay, it happens. It shouldn't. And it was, you know, 
50 something years ago so I guess we can get away with saying things like I just said but watching the movie and the only criticism I have of Judas and the Black Messiah is that the actors who play Lakeith is 29 I think and um, the guy who plays Hampton is 32 they're you know basically a decade too old to play the guys are playing but that wouldn't have played I mean I think that if they'd actually made that decision and cast younger actors I think that would have been distracting to a modern audience who had been more marveling at how these kids were doing this you know it'd almost be like a you know what's the the, the Bugsy Malone sort of situation than they would be at you know the actual story that's being told so I can forgive uh, Shaka King for casting it the way he cast it, especially since he kind of needed to cast name actors in it. And boy, Lakeith is really good. And the other guy whose name I can't remember, Daniel uh, from from Get Out. Daniel from Get Out. <laughs> you can tell I don't do any prep for these. I know, it's sad. Um, but it's really good. It might crack my top ten when I go down and, and start voting in, in, in a few minutes, which is got my ballot I'm going to fill it out and I'm definitely going to put Lakeef down as probably the best actor this year so you know we got a movie coming out in February which is the February 2021 which is one of the best of 2020 because that's how creepy our year has been anyway I'm at the 20 minute mark so I probably should just let this go and I will but um I want to tell you all to uh, hang in there we're going to get through this cold we're going to through this pandemic maybe the cold will help us get it through the pandemic uh we can see the other side of it it's coming and all we have to do is uh you know kind of hang in there for a couple more months and um we should be clear and then we can all go back to the movies again we can all go back to the bars again we can all go back and have our lives again though we might be a little bit more careful going forward Anyway, that's uh, on film for this week. Take care. We'll talk to you next week. And read the paper, please. Thanks.